Alright, okay, to kick us off for our first guest interview of the day, fans of this actor will know him from such titles as Axel from Kingdom Hearts, Raiden from Metal Gear Solid, Iruka from Naruto, just to name a few. He's the true vocal virtuoso in every way possible. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome the one, the only, Mr. Quinn Flynn! So before that, uh, I noticed the transitional music prior to that was Night at the Roxbury. <laughs> Anybody remember that movie? Oh, yeah. Oh, we got a few. We got a few, actually. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. Me, you, you, me, you. You, me, absolutely, okay, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, okay. <sighs> Quentin, how, how are you doing? How are you doing? Uh, it's, been, it's, been a, it's been a wild couple of days, hasn't it? It has been a wild ride. Uh, eight and a half hours overnight through the morning from Lincoln to here, uh, raining, lightning. There was, a, there was a tornado warning. Wind and tornado, yeah. And it just kept following us, it was tracking us. Like, stop! Get off the road! Don't go to the convention! But you, but you were like, you know, no matter the rain, no matter the tornado, as God or the deity of your choice, That's right. as your witness, you were gonna be here. That's it, had to make it. <laughs> had to honor the fans. Well, we're really psyched to have you, obviously, aren't we guys? <laughs> so, Quentin, let's kick it off where it all began. Obviously, we've got a room full of people here that would love to hear all about some of your most popular roles throughout the years. But I want to kick it to where it all began. Was showbiz always the plan? Or did something happen later in life that kind of brought us to where we are today? Uh, I think it always was the plan, consciously or unconsciously. I was an artist from the time I was a kid, doing fine arts, and um, I started acting and doing impressions as young as the age of eight. So, if you all have favorite impressionists on TV, I was doing impressions of impressionists' impressions at the age of eight, which seemed normal to me. It, it didn't seem unusual. So back then, like in the 70s, it was uh, uh, Late Night with Johnny Carson. All right. Glad to have you here. If you don't know who I am, I'm the precursor to the Lantern John Freak, Jay Leno. Yeah, you know, it's good to be here. I love you, Johnny. Big fan. I love to have a voice. Voice I Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, of <laughs> And, uh, gosh, Nixon was in the news back then when I was a kid, so we all know President Nixon from Futurama, if you don't know him from history. I am not a crook. I will not take your money today unless you willingly give it to me. <laughs> and uh, so yeah, did plays in high school, uh, all 12 of 12 plays from grades 9 through 12, had a rock and roll band, played the local scene in Cleveland and Akron, and, uh, and I went to school for radio, television, film, and theater, just kept doing more of it, was a video host uh, out of Cleveland, I was also on a sketch comedy show, and I did a radio show, and then I saw an ad in the paper that said you could do voiceovers for a career. I didn't know what that was uh, back in the day, and I thought, well, geez, maybe my voice would lend itself to something like that. And I took a commercial voiceover broadcast class, and that gave me my first glimpse of what the voiceover world as a working industry would be like. And within 10 months of graduation, my cousin Franklin, Franklin Chiano Lanza, how you doing? Told me, hey, Q-Ster, I'm moving out to the coast. It's 1988, I want to be in a hair metal band. You want to come with me? You with me or you against me? I said, well, I, I'm, I'm with you. Yeah, you're with me. Let's go. Because, you know, you got the TV, the radio, the acting thing. You already checked out Chicago. You checked out New York. Let's check out LA. All right, and so uh, my vacation became a permanent one, and I stayed in Los Angeles, and my first animation voiceover class was with um, 
Bob Bergen. Who is the voice of the big, uh, big, 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 big Porky Pig. And uh, he really kind of gave me the nod in the direction of where to go, what to do, create a new demo, knock on doors, get an agent, and start auditioning in Hollywood. And it sounds easy. It, it, it doesn't at all. It's not. Uh, right. And that was after about three jobs over the course of about four years when I finally implemented his teachings and got an agent and then started building a career. So what a lot of people don't realize is, at least what, based on my understanding, is that you don't just go, you just don't willy-nilly audition and just immediately get parts. Like there's plenty of rejection along the road, is there not? Absolutely. I mean, I like to say it's about selection and not rejection. In the beginning, it just feels like rejection because if you don't hear back from a particular audition, then you feel like a failure. At least I did, you know. Just like going for a job interview, because that's what it is. But we'd have multiple job interviews. And I would call my agent and go, well, did you hear back? Did you hear back? Did you hear back? And I'd say, no, 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 it doesn't work that way. When, when we get the call back for you or the job, we'll let you know. But in the meantime, just go about your business, um, you know, have a day. Just do the audition, let it go. Do the audition, let it go. It's kind of very, uh, you know, like Mr. Miyagi from Karate Kid. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. Let go, move on, let go, move on, move on, let go. Surrender, accept. Do you accept? You surrender. But you will have power in that surrender and acceptance from a power greater than yourself. Together we are one. One is alone. But together we are one power greater than. Accept surrender. So goodbye. Hello. I don't know why you say goodbye. I say hello. A round of applause. So it's easy to ask you to do that though. Like go to the audition and then just go about your day like nothing happened. But especially when you're trying to make this your sole source of income. Yeah. How is that possible? Well, it's tough, it really is. I mean, I, I, I don't know what it's like today as much. I can say what it was like in the earlier days where I would run into a lot of actors and actresses because we were auditioning physically at casting houses and at different studios. So we would see each other, we'd chat with each other, we'd commiserate, um, sometimes we'd have lunch, we, you know, kind of champion each other. Of course, there would be those who didn't climb on that um, uh, Wahoo wagon. Bandwagon? Bandwagon. Instead, they'd be like, well, would you go? Let me tell you what I got. Today, I'm doing a shoot over uh, in Culver City. Tomorrow, I'm doing a campaign for Pepsi. Would you audition for them? Doritos? Booked it. And so, you know. There's always somebody like that, and I'm sure you went to school with them. And they're, they're still out there in the real world, so you just kind of nod your head and go, okay, I'll remember that. Stay away from him, stay away from her. Um, but yeah, in the meantime, you live life like anybody else. Um, create opportunities, reach out to people, uh, practice things, have hobbies. Um, and of course, because of you know COVID, what's going on the last couple of years, it's been strange. Uh, everybody's up in more of a sense of isolation. I'm so glad we're here now with each other. But it's taken the industry and it's fragmented it even more uh, so that everyone now seems to have a home studio. Definitely for auditioning, oftentimes for work. And you can now be almost anywhere and do this job. Or as I said before, you used to have to go to New York or LA for the big markets. Chicago, secondary. Everything else is tertiary. So those who've grown up in the internet, um, you know, hats off to you. It's a lot easier. So what do I do in between? Oh yeah, I panic. <laughs> <laughs> well, would you say that now that the market has arguably become a little bit more saturated, do you find that it's a bit more competitive now, being able to secure these roles? Yeah, I, well, I think so. I mean, it's always been competitive, that's for sure. Um, and with changing trends, that, you know, causes some opportunities to maybe go away, but some other ones to stay. Um, it, it's one of those things as an artist, uh, 
uh, you have to just kind of go with the flow. Um, yeah, I'd be lying if I said it was easy. It, it, it's always competitive. Uh, you really have to be an entrepreneur and uh, you know have a, a lot of guts and gusto, a lot of faith, and um, just keep going for it. If it's what you want to do, then it's what you will do. And in the meantime, if you need other ways to pay your bills, you know, pick another job here and there. You know, just try to have fun. Luckily, you wanted to do it, and you did do it because you have a massive amount of really popular and successful roles in the years. I'd like to talk about three of them, with the first being one I think is going to be pretty popular. Let's talk about Axel. Axel from Kingdom Hearts, yes. Got it memorized. Um. So, so tell me a little bit about the process that you went to audition for the role, maybe any fun experiences you experienced while playing the role, anything at all. Let's start there. Well, you know, the interesting thing about King Hearts is that when I auditioned for the role of Axel, there really, it didn't exist in the world as we know it. So it was all brand new. And I gave the casting director what it was she wanted and the producers. They were asking for, you know, my, my type, which is kind of a youthful sounding guy who's, who can be earnest, who can be tough, and can also be a little sarcastic. So the director, Chris Zimmerman, uh, or Chris Zimmerman Salter, uh, knew me from working with me on The Real Adventures of Johnny Quest in 1996. Bandit, Haji, or his dad. And uh, she worked with me on the Metal Gear series, riding, you know, with, as Raiden, where I was a world weary war toward cyborg ninja. But sometimes in here, so not as young as Johnny, not as old as Jack. Axel's somewhere in between, kind of cool, kind of casual, kind of kick back. But a good friend, with a lot of sea salt ice cream, words of wisdom, time on his hands. So I just gave her what she asked for, and I happened to be the guy that they picked for the role. And little did I know back then that it was going to turn into this dynasty, you know, akin to Star Wars. We had no clue back then. No clue. It was just another audition. Especially since now we're at, what, Kingdom Hearts 4? After a whole number of spin-off ones as well? Yeah. Oh, that, oh that, was a, that was a cheer. Okay. Yes. <laughs> was it excited? Very much. Very grunge. It was an excited grunge. Ah! It's an affirmation. Well, speaking on the series as a whole, I was curious, uh, kind of your input on it, because it? as we all know, at least Kingdom Hearts fans know, the, the overall tone of the uh, games can be a little bit, let's call it melodramatic. Yeah. But uh, with the, were you ever a big fan of it outside of just voicing that character? You know, the strong, the strong themes of friendship conquers all, hearts, hearts again. Were you ever a fan of that, or was it really just, you just liked Axel? Well, I mean, I'm, I do love the idea that love conquers all. Love is the answer. Love is a verb. To, to love is a verb. You know, and I think we should all love each other. And that's ultimately what everybody in the world wants more than anything else. Um, and friendship does triumph, you know, if we band together in honor. Uh, the bonds of friendship. So certainly that, that's been a theme that for me in my life has been very important. Friends, you know, are the family you get to choose and uh, family is important too. So I, I love that. Um, anything above and beyond it, uh, I, I may not know as well because I don't, I don't uh, watch my work so much or listen to it. I've, I've, I've checked the playbacks, you know, the playthroughs. But I've not played the games because it turns out I'm not a gamer. Yeah. Really? Not, not a gamer yet has been in countless games throughout your career. I know, it's ironic. <laughs> so, what would you say? Is there a certain line outside of his iconic line that really has stuck with you in the years? Um, let me think. Well, I mean, I'm always being asked, you know, to say, got it memorized, and then, I'm so flattered, you know, and burn, baby. So those are our big ones, and of course, uh, I think one that's nice is, what is it? Uh, oh, if you have a dream, don't wait, act. One of life's little rules. I never knew it was one of life's little rules. No one ever told me that. 
but apparently it is. So. Better late than never. Exactly. Well, let's do a little bit of a tone shift here. So Axel, very complicated for sure, but also turns out, just like spoiler, turns out to be good in the end. Let's talk about one of your most uh, complex characters. Let's talk about a little bit about Raiden. Yes. There it is. There it is. What would you like to know? So let's first kick us off just like you did Axel. Tell us how you got the role, maybe fun anecdotes involved with playing him, anything at all. Um, Raiden, similarly, I showed up for an audition at um, the recording studio for Chris Zimmerman once again. And at that time, she, I do remember her saying, you know, he's a rookie, um, and he's tough. He's in a world not of his own making. I want him to be heroic and earnest, but not as squeaky clean as Johnny Quest, because she worked with me on Johnny. So, if Johnny's here, you know, Ryden should be in here, kind of in the, you know, right in this pocket. So he's a young guy, as opposed to Solid Snake, you know, who's in that range. I don't really do a snake impression, but whenever I hear David Hader in my head, it's Ryden. <sighs> Practically kissing the mic. Right. <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> Do you have a cold snake? What? Uh, no. I just like to uh, gravel. I like to uh, grunt. I have stomach problems. There are antacids for those. Uh, so, you know, we started with Rookie Ryden, very young and earnest, and uh, seemed to be a spoiler to some who thought that they were going to be doing Metal Gear Solid 2 with the snake. And they were a little disappointed, but over time they grew to love him because in Metal Gear Solid 4, they shifted his voice into this zone, where he became the world-weary, war-torn cyborg ninja. Twisted. I'm the white devil. I'm, I'm Jack. Jack is back. Jack the Ripper. But I'm not bad. I'm good. I'm conflicted. And then I find out at the end I have a child, but it's a my child. He doesn't like me, he's frightened of me. He thinks I look like Frankenstein, a monster. Frankenstein's monster. As opposed to Dr. Frankenstein. <laughs> In Young Frankenstein with Gene Wilder. Whatever I say, do not let me out of that room. Nice catch, by the way. Thank you. Definitely wish I had those reflexes when I just dropped my quick clipboard. <laughs> so you already confessed that you're not really much of a gamer, so I... When you got the role, you probably had no idea that the original Metal Gear Solid was one of the breakout hits on the PlayStation 1. So I, with that, did you have any idea, once it was all said and done, that Raiden to this day would be one of the most greatly appreciated tactical espionage uh, stealth games of this generation? Of course. You did it. Yeah, why wouldn't it be? No. I you hire Quentin Flynn to do a job, and he does it. That's right. He owns it. He's going to give you the best. You wanted the best, you got the best. Um, no, I didn't have a clue, but he is the uh, master ninja, isn't he? He is a true assassin. Um, yeah, man, because we went on to Rising Revengeance, uh, which was amazing in scope and color and tone and, and comedy, even. Uh, Everybody got everything they wanted, and are, of course would like more. But he is kind of iconic, you're right, in that way, and that everybody else is compared to him, I think. I do have to ask, so when you're doing Rising Revengeance, while, while Raiden's voice has gone from, you know, the typical young guy to the, I mean, essentially, almost entirely cyborg, I mean, there's certain lines in that game that almost sounds like you're gargling class. Like, how hard was that voice to do on your, on your throat? Well, I, fortunately, I was able to find a particular spot in which to do it so that it didn't hurt me. Um, so I can just slide into it, you know, and say, There are three people walking out of this room at this moment. If they make it out alive, good for them. Thank you for being here. Thanks for playing our game. There'll be some lovely parting gifts for you out in the parking lot where it's hot. So hot too. Like Thursday, it was, I think, mid 50, late 50s, and then now it's like upper 70s. Right, with humidity. But with humidity, exactly, which is not good for my hair. Right. <laughs> Although your hair looks great. Thank you. Let's give it up for his hair. <laughs> All right, stop. 
you're gonna make me cry. All right, let's talk. Speaking of making me cry, let's talk about our last character that we're gonna explore before we move on. Now you guys know this guy. He's one of one of many father figures in this show. Let's talk about Aruka. Yes. So again, let's give, give us a brief overview of the character, fun anecdotes involved in getting or playing the part, anything at all. Aruka Sensei. Uh, again, I auditioned for him not knowing uh, the series because I, I, I didn't read manga so, or manga, so I wouldn't know who he was, but I was told that he was a, um, you know, a mentor uh, and a ninja, and that he was kind of efficient, uh, that he was in charge of a group you know, of youth, that he wanted to impress upon them uh, the facts and the features of what they were doing as something special, something to honor, that has tradition, and really, out of everyone in class, the one student he loved the most and was also bothered by the most and irritated by the most was Naruto. So anyone else could ruffle his feathers a little bit, but with Naruto, it was a lot. And he knew that he needed some guidance along the way, so the neat thing to me is I found out over the years from fans is that they found Aruka to be a father figure. Um, and I guess that's because Aruka, uh, you know, saw that kind of lost boy in Naruto and would try to encourage him the best he could and say things to him like, if you're good, I'll take you out for some ramen. If you're not good, well, I might just have to yell at you until you're good. <laughs> that didn't always work. So. <laughs> I can't help myself. I'm frustrated. I want the best for you. So in the show Naruto, Naruto has a plethora of different father figures, be it Eruka yeah. or Minato or Jiraiya, but tons of others. Sure. What do you think it is about Eruka, just as a character, that you think resonates not only with Naruto, but we're fans of the show? Well, I, I just think his uh, honesty, his vulnerability, uh, straightforwardness, I think what you get is what you see. and. Um, there's a warmth. I think there's a genuine warmth there. And I know as far as acting goes, acting is being, acting is doing, it's, it's being in the moment as we are right now, with me talking to you, uh, you know, telling you what I experience, and it's moment to moment. So when I'm working on a character, you know, working as Ziruka, just as I would be Raiden or Axel or Reno or Johnny Quest or two, I'm that person, that emotion in that moment. And, you know, there are some very vulnerable and intimate and loving scenes there. And, and I think truth rings. I think it resonates. And people know it when they hear it and when they feel it and when they see it. So I think that's what makes him um, probably the most trusted, straightforward, and, and uh, honest character to connect with because he is quite sincere and vulnerable. He's, he's a protector, he's a leader, he cares, and um, he doesn't seem to do anything out of character. And if he does, he uh, owns up to it. And that's, um, that's the true measure uh, of a, a good human being. Is that the sort of character that you enjoy personifying the most? The vulnerable, the emotional, wear their heart on the sleeves? Or do you prefer roles like Raiden, who keeps people at an arm's distance, or more often than not, a sword's distance? Yeah. Um, good question. I like them both for different reasons. Uh, I would say it work is pretty easy to, easier to do because he's, he's me. He's right where I am. So I get to meet him right there. I don't have to put anything on. Where with Raiden, I do have to add some colors. And that can be fun, especially for the comedic stuff. Um, but I'll jump ahead, maybe, to Jin the Virtuoso. Uh, Jin the Virtuoso is one of the first villains I've played that I actually created. And Jin the Virtuoso knows you so well. Some people call him evil, but an evil genius doesn't know they're evil, do they? No. Perhaps they know that they're a genius, but they don't see anything wrong with what they're doing. Stop! Thank you for honoring 
my direction. Carry on. So you did actually beat me to the punch. So with Jin, is there any wild anecdotes involved with getting that part, or is it just kind of true to the course? Well, with Jin, yeah, interestingly, I auditioned for it, and <clears throat> then I was I was over in England visiting cousins in uh, specifically Thorn, Doncaster, Yorkshire. And I was at my cousin Lisa's house, and I got an email saying, we need you to redo the audition for Jin. And I, <clears throat> I can't remember if they wanted him younger sounding or older sounding. It was one of the two, but they had four specific uh, video clips for me to look at. One was a, uh, the Bond villain in Skyfall. The other was Dexter. Uh, the third was Anthony Hopkins in Psycho. Mother, mother, are you there? And Kevin Spacey in the movie Seven. Look in the box. Don't you want to know what's in the box? Hmm. I think you do. And this guy, fault villain, was Mr. Bomb. I don't know what you're doing, but you're going to find yourself on the bloody end of a sharp stick. And then Dexter, you know, I, I don't recall Dexter so much as he had an intensity about him. He's very straightforward. I'm going to eat this sandwich or your head. So I took the four of those and I blended them and I distilled them into a gin soup. And I gave it a little more character, a little more panache. But I also found the weird, the odd, the curious for this man who's in charge of drama, music, magic, dance, and murder. So I did this audition on my cell phone with a audition, uh, a microphone app, and sent it from England to the studio in the U U.S. Well, my cousin Lisa was coming down the stairs and she heard this voice and she didn't see me. And she was frightened. Very frightened. And I said, what, what's wrong? She goes, what was that? Was that you? I said, yeah. She goes, oh, don't do it. Stop it. I said, you mean this? She said, yes, that. Stop it. I've got chills, I do. I've got chills. So yeah, it freaked her out. I thought she was joking. But she was quite sincere, and that's when I thought, I think I've got something here. Yeah. So I scared my cousin, booked the job on an app, a recording app on a cell phone. I went to a little kind of closeted area with a pillow to dampen the sound and gave it my best, and my best was enough. Modern technology. There you go. <laughs> so for the last 10 minutes, I'm actually gonna go to you audience members right now, if you guys have any questions for Quentin Flynn, I want you to raise your hand. And Scott, are you gonna be the one to go over them, or am I? I could use the cardio. All right, cardio it is. All right, if you guys have a question for Quentin Flynn, please raise your hand and I will make my way to you. All right, sir, is that? Okay, we're good. All right, sir, what is your question? Um, what role that you've auditioned for and did not get do you consider like the one that got away? Like the role you least, or sorry, that you most regret not getting? Well, fortunately, just about every role that I have gotten, I've been grateful to have. And there haven't been many roles that others have had or gotten that I wanted, except in hindsight. There happens to be a popular series that everybody knows called SpongeBob SquarePants. No. Yeah. Now, 20 plus years ago, you have to understand, when it didn't exist, you have to imagine that as actors we get um, audition sides, the pieces of copy, the picture and a description of all these characters from all kinds of uh, animated series, video games, commercials, in all kinds of different worlds. So we're constantly filtering through and giving them our best. And when I saw on a page, it wasn't just me, but a number of other actors saw a talking sponge with overalls. 
and a starfish, and it was like, what's this? SpongeBob SquarePants? That is the stupidest name I've ever heard. There's no way this thing's gonna take off. Who wrote this? Some idiot? What's the other one? A starfish. What was he? He's a sidekick. What does he do? Nothing. He's not that bright. Oh my god, why do I work so hard at writing anything? So, yeah, just for longevity, uh, fun, and income alone, it would have to be SpongeBob SquarePants. And, uh, and I can say I didn't do anything terribly different than, uh, than Tom Kenny, the gifted Tom Kenny, who's a friend of mine. But Tom, uh, the gentleman who was casting knew Tom, and this is what Tom had told me that, you know, he, he told him what he was looking for, and Tom gave him that, and so he got what he wanted right off the bat. So there really was no chance for anyone else to get it. It was meant to be. You know, what we didn't know, in order to Tom at the time, is that it was going to be just this overall huge success that would go on for decades and spawn a movie and I think a musical too, right? So, yeah, not unlike The Simpsons. But that would be the only one, just because, you know, having any kind of career um, security, job security, is good. But that's it. Yeah. All right, who's next? Nope, right here. You've had a million and a half roles throughout the years. What has been your most favorite, even if it wasn't like popular or didn't go on for a long time, just your absolute favorite? That's a tough one. Um, I enjoy them all when I do them all. And uh, I would say my favorite at one time was Spider-Man because as a child, I was a huge Spider-Man fan. Loved the comics, loved the uh, rerun of the 60s cartoon show that they showed us. And to me, he was the first stand-up comic superhero. Uh, sardonic, sarcastic, ironic. And getting to play him in Marvel's Ultimate Alliance was a dream. I only wished I would have gotten to play him more in other uh, different scenarios. But, um, so for that alone, he would be my favorite. Um, I enjoyed playing Timon a lot, um, which was fun replacing Nathan Lane. Uh, he went on to do the movie The Birdcage, and then I sl slid into his role to be running around saying, I kind of went hot, what a wonderful phrase, you know? And so there was a little bit of improv in that, and I also enjoyed playing Sheldon on my life as a teenage robot. Because not only did I get to play Sheldon, but because he was in love with Jenny, he thought, I know, I'll create a metallic superhero and win over her affections that way. I'll create Silver Shell. And I was the voice of Silver Shell. And of course, he won Jenny's affection and love. And Sheldon didn't get any. And of course, Jenny also went to the dance with Don Prima, the prima donna. Hi, Sheldon. Going to the dance this weekend? No, you're not. I am. With who? Jenny. In my car, because I have one. That's fine. So that might have been the most favorite show for multiple characters and improvisation. I did those three roles plus about 50 others. There you go. All right, oh, right over here. Don't worry, that side of the room, I'll get to you. So, uh, across the games, right, and there's basically three versions of writing, really. Yeah. Um, of those, what would you say is your, which is your favorite writing? whether it's you know, your favorite of performing or just your favorite as a character? Uh, that would be Revengeance. Because uh, by, the, by the time we got there, we got to incorporate everything. All elements of Raiden and, like I said, uh, some humor as well. Because he goes into um, a town, I want to say it's in Mexico, and uh, he wants to blend in, so he walks into a shop and he purchases a sombrero and a, a poncho and he puts it on, and he's a, he's a cyborg, and by this time his, his feet become these bizarre, like, heels that he can, you know, do acrobats with and kind of slice and shoot. And, I mean, basically, it, it, it's, it's a robot, an attractive robot with blonde hair, who's got a sombrero on and a poncho and says, 
they'll never recognize me now. So I thought, you know, good humor. I like that. Pardon me. Here you go, sir. My question for you would be this: um, for someone who does a lot of voice acting and is your favorite lines and stuff like that. Is there one line that you do that you never get tired of? I think it would be something that goes like this. Mr. Flynn, we have a blank check for you. Put in any amount, sign off on it, and we'll cash it. What say you? Yes. <laughs> that would be my favorite. Um, any favorites in the, the, the roles I've played? Um, I would say, you know, I do a lot of impressions. So, the thing is, you know, I've done a lot of Paul McCartney. And Paul used to say, because he's a vegetarian and a vegan, he'd say, hey, mind yourself, go veggie. <laughs> I probably did that, you know. 3,472 times. So, I have an affection for that line. I'm just glad that he moved on and doesn't say that anymore. All right, we have time for two more. Oh, Mark, right back there. Oh, pardon me again. Crazy, going back there to talk to a woman. I wonder <laughs> if she actually wants to talk to you. No, she definitely wants to talk to you. Oh, me? She doesn't really care about me. You, me. Do you just, like, randomly just say any voice lines from, like, any of the games where you're, like, alone at your house or anything? Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. I have to ask my wife. <laughs> I mean, there are times that I do break into character. Uh, usually after something I've seen recently on TV or somebody I've been listening to. And sometimes I practice unconsciously. Like, I, I was watching... Um, Dr. Jordan Peterson in several interviews, and I was in bed, and I don't know what my wife was doing, and I suddenly said, Oh, honey, if you want the pickles, get the pickles. That's good. Take care of yourself. Make sure that you know what you want, and if you want to go for it, life is hard. Life is tough, but we have to make choices. I, 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 I. I don't know, but I do know, that is to say, there are quite a few things that touch me, especially people when they laugh. You heard them. They're mocking the halls of justice. So, something like that, you know, I might do, and she's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm working on my Jordan Peterson. Why? He just popped up. Uh, I, I will say that when I've been at airports and haven't gotten good service, there was one time I, I tested one of the uh, uh, ladies working behind the counter who was kind of nasty to me. And I came back 20 minutes later and put on an English accent. I thought, you know, because Americans love the English. So I, I put on a bit of Hugh Grant. Now, he hasn't been around for a while, but he's, you know, he stutters a little bit. And he's very regal and kind and sweet. So I said to the woman, who I'd said to before, um, where is the gate and what time does this flight leave? Sir, if you look up there, it'll show you exactly when you leave, where to stay, and what to do. The bathrooms are behind you. I'm busy, thanks. So when I came back as Hugh, I said, oh, excuse me, but I, I, I don't mean to trouble you with this, but um, I, I was curious, I was looking at the ticket, and it's a bit confusing to me. So, where might I go for my connecting flight? What gate? Um, and what time would that be if it's not too much trouble? She looked at me and she said, Oh, no trouble at all, sir. <laughs> in fact, I'll write it down for you. Are you enjoying your stay here in Chicago Midway? Oh, yes, very much so. Very much so. You English, you're so nice. Well, I'll just say the same about you. And I do. Thank you. Here you go. Have a good night. Yeah, you too. <laughs> All right, 
right, we have time for about one more. Nope, I see it, I see it. I'm not quite as fast as you, Sonic. It's no use! How did you get to the role of Summer? Well, like any other role, I auditioned. Uh, auditioning for actors is like a job interview for anybody else in life. So imagine you lose a job, you need a job, you gotta go audition for a job, I mean interview for a job. So for Sonic, I mean Silver, I auditioned him. They said they wanted him in this range, and they wanted him to look like that, and have this voice come out of that, looking like that, being like this. Come on, do it, you can. I love your blue, love the silver too, right on. I'm silver, how about you? And they went, yeah, let's use this guy. Thank God he's not Hugh Grant. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this has been our live Q&A with the one and only Quentin Flynn. Thank you so much. Make, make sure to hang out, hang out right now if you guys want to check out our live Q&A with Megan Hollingshead, which will be right here at 4.15. Until then, we'll see you guys in a bit. See you around. I'll be signing soon. And Megan's great. And a hand for Zach. Great questions, great soul, great hair. <laughs> you don't get to talk anymore. Also, hey, real quick, if any of you are being getting prejudged for the cosplay contest.